from A and D. This is Biography. He looked at you with eyes that were absolutely piercing, not hostile, just real sincerity that said this man is unusual. He was small, even by Vietnamese standards. Only four feet, 11 inches tall, and barely 100 pounds, he appeared frail. He tried to project this image of himself as a simple, modest, emaciated, kind of wandering scholar. In fact, he was a tough guy. Perhaps no leader in history has resisted the guns of the enemy as stubbornly or as long as this little man. He's a very shrewd politician and a very good actor. He had an unshakable will that helped liberate a country and humble a superpower. In the late 19th century, Indochina was France's most valuable colony. The French made huge amounts of money with rubber and rice exports, especially from the territory now known as Vietnam. Unfortunately, the native people received little or no benefit of this wealth. They had few rights within their own country and little hope for a better life. Life was only slightly better for the family of Ho Chi Minh. What we do know about his family generally is that they were upper class or gentry, as were all the uh, communist revolutionaries. Ho Chi Minh's father, Huynh Sin Sok, came from the village of Kim Lien in Nghe An, a poor province in central Vietnam. On May 19, 1890, his wife gave birth to their third child and their second son. He was named Nguyen Sin Kung, but would one day be known around the world as Ho Chi Minh. When Ho turned 11, tragedy struck the family. While his father was away, his mother died shortly after giving birth to a third son. You can imagine the effect this had. I mean, be, being faced with the fact that his father is away and his mother had died and he was responsible for this, uh, basically an infant. And when his father came back to Hue, he took him back to his home village. Ho Chi Minh's father served as a Mandarin or local official and spent a great deal of time away from home. Fortunately, relatives and family friends helped take care of Ho and his brother and sister. Initially, Ho's early education was in the traditional study of Chinese characters and Confucian philosophy. But in his early teens, uh, his father uh, apparently became convinced that for his sons to succeed, they needed a French education. He sent both of them to a preparatory school run by the imperial regime in such a way as to instruct the students in the French language and French culture. Though Ho's father worked for the imperial bureaucracy, he routinely criticized it for so easily relinquishing the country's independence to the French. He was recalled to Hue, and eventually he was dismissed entirely from the bureaucracy. And it's at that point that his life fell apart. And he went to Saigon, he took a job for a while on a rubber plantation, later he sold traditional medicines. Ho's father spent the rest of his life wandering the countryside, struggling to make a living, while Ho lived in Hawaii. He saw less and less of his father. This had a great impact on Ho. He also believed that his father had been punished for simply saying what everyone knew was true. Most Vietnamese suffered greatly at the hands of their colonial masters. Those who protested or even complained were often imprisoned beaten, or even killed by the omnipotent French colonials. In 1908, at the age of 17, Ho was studying at the prestigious National Academy in Hue. One day, a group of farmers marched past the school, protesting the high level of Mandarin corruption and excessive taxation. 
Ho translated their demands into French so the local colonial officials could read them. It was his first revolutionary act, and he attracted the attention of the dreaded Sûreté, or French secret police. The next day, Ho was summarily expelled from the academy. It was his last day of formal schooling in Vietnam. So here's this young Ho Chi Minh who is becoming educated and has a certain amount of resentment toward French colonialism. But at the same time, he knows enough about France to be captivated by the great uh, French ideals of uh, liberty, equality, fraternity, and he wants to see how those ideals are really practiced in France. They're not practiced in, in Vietnam, where you have a rather pr repressive French colonial system. Ho had inherited his father's rebelliousness and his wanderlust. At the age of 21, he entered a merchant marine school where he learned how to be a kitchen helper. This new skill enabled him to leave Vietnam and go abroad. I think he left for two reasons. One is maybe quest for education, uh, that he would be able to get better education in France, provided he could afford it. Second, uh, he probably did not see much of an economic opportunity in Vietnam at that point of time. Ho was hired by the French passenger liner, the La Touche Treville, and in 1911 began an odyssey that would take him to nearly every corner of the world. Over the next few years, he saw the terrible impact of colonialism on many other countries. This had a profound influence upon him. Finally, Ho arrived in France. Despite his anti-colonial sentiments, Ho applied for entrance to the French colonial school that trained officials to serve in France's colonies around the world. This was hardly the career path of an anti-French revolutionary. Ho's application was turned down. There's no indication as to how he reacted to the rejection, except that we may assume that it probably uh, strengthen his assumption that he couldn't expect to work from within the system, uh, that he was going to have to work outside the system. In other words, it could very well have been one of a whole series of steps uh, that eventually led him into becoming a revolutionary. Ho wandered around France for a year or so. He supported himself with a variety of odd jobs, including gardening and dishwashing. He went back out to sea between 1911 and 1917, traveling to Africa, South America, and even the United States. On one trip, he reportedly jumped ship in Boston and made his way down to New York City. I mean, here he is seeing, as it would be to any kid from this faraway place, the skyscrapers, the highways, uh, taking the subway up to the Bronx, taking the ferry to Hoboken. He was absolutely dazzled by the Statue of Liberty and everything it represented. While working as a dishwasher in New York's Chinatown, Ho was amazed to learn that immigrants in the U.S. were entitled to legal rights that the Vietnamese weren't allowed to have under the French in their own country. He said, I was with the lowest labor types in New York. There were blacks, there were Chinese, and they weren't quite as well treated as the Anglo-Saxons. But he said, you know, they could all vote. And this impressed him tremendously. Shortly before the start of World War I, Ho left America and sailed to England. He found work in the kitchen of the famous Carlton Hotel under the legendary French chef Escoffier. Escoffier is very impressed by Ho because Ho speaks French, because he's very courteous, and eventually is promoted to being the assistant pastry chef. While in London, Ho had met many other passionate anti-colonialists from places like India, Africa, and Ireland. These contacts rekindled Ho's own nationalist notions. He rededicated himself to liberating his homeland. In 1917, he decided to forego a promising career as a pastry chef and move to Paris. He would learn how to become 
a revolutionary. Ho Chi Minh arrived in Paris toward the end of World War I. There was a large Vietnamese community living there. But more important, this was where the decisions that affected colonial Vietnam were made. Ho was determined to help change French policy toward his country. But first, he wanted to experience Paris. He wandered around the town and uh, would go to art galleries, uh, take in lectures, improving his French. He used to love to go to music halls, and uh, one of his favorite singers was Maurice Chevalier. And he memorized these songs and, and went on for the rest of his life uh, uh, without the straw hat, of course, uh, singing Maurice Chevalier songs. In Paris, Ho supported himself through a variety of odd jobs. He worked as a cook and he retouched photos. He even reported on boxing matches and reviewed films for a French newspaper. Of course, his primary goal was to somehow organize Vietnamese expatriates into a movement that would pressure the French government into improving conditions in his homeland. People who encountered Ho Chi Minh in those days tended to say pretty much the same things. A very intense young man, very anxious to learn, very idealistic, uh, a man very much driven by ideas. But what was remembered about him perhaps more than anything else was his sharp eyes that uh, essentially seemed to penetrate the soul of the person who was talking to him. Ho discovered that there were many Frenchmen who were sympathetic to his cause. These liberals encouraged him to join their socialist group and to write and publish his own ideas. Soon, Ho and other Vietnamese expatriates began publishing an anti-colonial newspaper directed toward the Vietnamese community in France. Their leaflets were even smuggled back to Vietnam. All of his writings really are on that theme. What a rotten deal colonials are getting all over the French empire, which indeed they were. Ho's point of thinking is, how do you fix this? Do you fix it with revolution? Do you fix it with violence? Uh, how do you do it? Writing under the pseudonym Nguyen I Quoc, or Nguyen the Patriot, Ho simply advocated better treatment and equal rights for his people, not revolution. He achieved a near legendary status in certain circles back in Vietnam, where his rhetoric was considered visionary. Ho also attracted the attention of the imperial regime back home. They accused him of inciting treason and condemned him to death if he ever returned to Vietnam. In 1919, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson traveled to the Versailles Peace Conference to present his famous 14-point plan for world peace. Ho and his associates discovered that one of Wilson's key points was that all nations deserve the right to self-determination. Ho believed that this meant that the U.S. was advocating the end of the colonial system. And Ho Chi Minh, thinking that this might apply to Vietnam, got himself all dressed up in a cutaway coat and striped pants and a top hat, and he went out to Versailles carrying with him a document that he had written, which was a kind of... Uh, inventory of various cases of French repression in Vietnam. And his idea was to give this to Wilson so that the United States would then exert pressure on France. Well, he got very rudely rebuffed when he tried to go in to see Wilson or even deliver this. Ho had believed that President Wilson would be sympathetic to Vietnam's plight. He was greatly disappointed that he was unable to present his case. This forced him to look elsewhere for help. A socialist showed Ho a paper that had been written by Vladimir Lenin. In it, the Soviet leader wrote that one of the keys to the spread of communism was the liberation of all colonies. 
the Russians wanted to end colonialism, not because they loved the people who were under colonial rule, but for their own selfish interests, they wanted to weaken the Western powers. But regardless of what their motivation was, they were the only power at the time to advocate it and to actively want to offer help. And it's at that point, as he basically points out, that he determined to become a follower of Lenin, not because he had any understanding of Marxist ideology, but because he loved the strategy that Lenin had set forth as a means of liberating the colonial peoples. In 1920, Ho became one of the founding members of the French Communist Party. He was 30 years old. He had become a great propagandist while living in Paris, but he wanted to learn how to turn rhetoric into revolutionary action. He believed there was really only one place to learn this craft, Moscow. In 1923, Ho received an invitation to join the Comintern, the organization set up by the Soviets to export Marxism and Leninism around the world. He jumped at the opportunity. He disappeared from Paris, leaving his friends wondering what had happened to him. I think what drew Ho to Moscow, first and foremost, was nationalism, the desire to find help to liberate his country and his people. Ho became an important member of the Comintern. He now took his orders from Moscow. I always felt that Ho Chi Minh had very little time for Marxism as a philosophy, as a way of interpreting history. He had great admiration for Leninism and the techniques and the methods to be used. The rest of the world may have abhorred Lenin's tactics, but Ho was devoted to them. He believed that he had found the blueprint for liberating his homeland. Ho received his first international assignment when he was sent to Canton in South China to help organize communist cadres. It was here that he also began a clandestine lifestyle that would last nearly 30 years. He went underground, so to speak. And you have him wandering around the world under a wide variety of aliases, some of them Vietnamese, some of them Chinese, depending on where he was and what purpose he needed. If, for example, he contributed to a French newspaper, he'd call himself Victor Le Bon. If he uh, contributed to a Russian newspaper, he'd call himself Nafransky, and so forth. In 1927, Ho was nearly arrested when the Chinese nationalist leader, Chiang Kai-shek, turned against the communists. Ho narrowly escaped capture and a likely death sentence and eventually made his way to Siam, or present-day Thailand. He avoided detection by agents of the Sioité or French secret police via a clever ruse. He learned some Thai, shaved his head, donned a saffron robe, and traveled as a Buddhist monk. There was a large Vietnamese community living in Northeast Thailand. So Ho preached his cause as he wandered from village to village in disguise. I don't know of any other leader of his stature having done this kind of masquerading under different guises or having had to change his name so many times, which makes me wonder whether this was just a necessity or was it the sense of the drama in the man that prompted him to do this. For most of the 1930s, Ho's whereabouts were not known. He had even been reported dead. Ho just disappeared. He was either in the cave of Yunnan with Mao, uh, he was in a Stalin jail. There's no world figure that you can say that we don't know where he was for almost uh, a decade. And again, this was not accidental. I mean, he didn't want to be found. Ho emerged again on the world stage shortly before the outbreak of World War II. He'd always believed that there would one day be a time when the conditions would be just right to begin the liberation of his homeland.
France fell to Germany in the early months of World War II, and the pro-German Vichy government took over the colonial rule of Vietnam, Ho believed that the moment had arrived. In early 1941, he slipped across the Chinese border and into the jungles of North Vietnam. Incredibly, this was the first time Ho had set foot in his homeland in over 30 years. He was armed only with his ideas, but he was determined to lead a revolution, to liberate his country, or to die trying. When Ho Chi Minh walked across the border into North Vietnam in 1941, it marked the first time he had set foot in his country since 1911. He had no weapons, almost no money, and very little support. But he was determined to organize a guerrilla movement that would drive the foreigners from his country. He calls the movement the Viet Minh, which is an acronym for uh, Independence League. And he takes for the first time this name Ho Chi Minh, which means roughly bringer of light. So Ho Chi Minh begins to exist under that name, the famous name, uh, now 1941. Well, there seems to be something of a myth that Ho Chi Minh, when he came back to Vietnam after 30 years of absence, uh, was looked upon by, quote, everybody as the leader of Vietnam. I, I doubt that that's, that that's the case because there was not the kind of media ability to influence uh, the thought of people in the countryside. At that time, 90, maybe 95 percent of the people in Vietnam lived in small villages and cultivated rice. There were educated Vietnamese in big cities like Hanoi and Saigon who greatly admired Ho's writings under his pen name Nguyen the Patriot. But they were in the minority. The vast majority of the people in the country were not familiar with Ho or his work. In fact, most of them could not read. So his main aim was how to communicate and become close to the peasants. So he managed to adapt this very um, popular style, uh, talking in very simply to the peasants and being like an uncle, you know, a member of the family. Ho brought the role that his father had played as the avuncular village mandarin or local public official to a national level. Though some critics believe that this persona was nothing short of a calculated act, it was effective and the movement gained momentum. I think Ho Chi Minh's goal determined his behavior. In order to reach the masses, he had to be looking and acting and living like a peasant, to be in communion with the needs of the peasants. Ho and his followers also promoted the notion that he was a lifelong celibate who didn't have time for romance or a family because he was so devoted to his cause. This was a myth. It's fairly clear now that he had several relationships. Whether they were formal marriages or not is difficult to substantiate because there are no certificates that we can point to. It's quite well established that he had either a Chinese wife or a Chinese concubine when he was in Hong Kong. No one knows at this point what happened to that woman. If Ho was married when he returned to Vietnam, it was to his cause he was much more interested in finding the right people to form the nucleus of his movement. One of Ho's best decisions was to enlist the help of a talented young man named Vo Nguyen Yap. Yap had a brilliant military mind and was a born leader. But when Yap and his men first encountered Ho, they didn't know who he was or why they should follow him. Ho told them that he had been trained in Moscow and that he was going to liberate the country by using the proven methods of his hero, Lenin. Yap and his men, and hundreds of others, soon joined Ho. I never thought of him as a revolutionary as much as an organization man. What he was a genius at was his ability to organize movements, the front organization particularly. A popular front is simply a group of groups united in a single purpose. 
Ho brought many of the other Vietnamese nationalist organizations together under his banner. But in order to do this, he had to focus on the issues that would appeal to the broadest possible group. One was the issue of national independence, and the other was what might loosely be called social justice, which would mean land reform, better working conditions, uh, democratic rights, and things of that type. You note here not, not a single word about communism, about collectives, about nationalization of industry, but very simple humanistic ideas that the vast majority of the Vietnamese people could accept. December 7, 1941, Japan bombed the U.S. fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and then launched an all-out attack against the British and Dutch colonies of Southeast Asia. Within weeks, Hong Kong, Malaya, Singapore, and Indonesia had all fallen to the Japanese Empire. The Japanese called off their attack on French Indochina when the local pro-Nazi Vichy colonial administration agreed to collaborate with Japan, Germany's Axis partner. Ho could very well have said, OK, I will side with the Japanese because they're like Asians. But he came to the conclusion very wisely that the Japanese are no better than the French. They're both aliens. Neither one of them is going to do us any good. Ho Chi Minh traveled to South China. Since the Chinese were also fighting Japan, he believed that he could get some military aid from the nationalist Chinese. To his surprise, he was arrested by the local authorities because he was a communist. Ho was thrown into prison. He kept a journal, writing mostly in the Chinese of his youth, in hopes of converting his captors to his point of view. In one poem, he wrote, My heart travels a thousand miles toward my native land. Innocent, I have now endured a whole year in prison. Using my tears for ink, I turn my thoughts into verse. Ho's health deteriorated as the months passed. He had to find a way out of prison, or he would never live long enough to liberate Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh spent 14 months enduring the worst imaginable treatment in prison. As the war worsened for the Chinese, Ho convinced his captors to release him so that he could gather intelligence on the Japanese. He was released in 1943 and walked all the way back to his old base in North Vietnam. His co-patriots were stunned. They thought he had died. Once again, he became the leader. He was 53 years old. After the US entered the war against Japan, Ho believed that getting American help was essential to Vietnam's future independence. When an American pilot was shot down in North Vietnam, he was brought all the way back to his base in China by Ho. And you've got to try to imagine this guy. He's wearing sandals and shorts. He's got this wispy beard and he looks like, you know, he weighs about 85 pounds and he looks like he'd be blown over with a feather. Ho offered his services to the commanding officer, General Claire Chenault of the legendary Flying Tigers. Chenault declined the offer, but the Office of Strategic Service, or OSS, America's wartime intelligence service was interested. They believed that Ho could help them rescue downed pilots, and more important, furnish intelligence information on the Japanese. Ho was accompanied back to his base by an OSS officer, giving credence to his claim that the U.S. was his ally. When the OSS began supplying radios, weapons, and training, it helped establish Ho's Viet Minh as the preeminent Vietnamese nationalist organization. 
But once again, Ho's life was in jeopardy. Ho took to his bed and really seemed very sick. So we sent in a paramedic. And indeed, his report, as best I can remember, was saying this, this cadaverous <laughs> old bag of bones is why he's living, I don't know. But he opened his kit and fed him every antibiotic he had, and all recovered. Ho greatly appreciated the Americans, and he impressed all of them. He not only spoke and wrote in English, but he seemed to understand their culture, too. He had also acquired a very American habit. He liked uh, to smoke American cigarettes, Philip Morris in particular. But he always carry in his front pocket uh, uh, Vietnamese um, uh, packets of Vietnamese cigarettes. And then th those are the ones that he will offer to the guests. In August of 1945, two atomic bombs brought the war to a rapid conclusion. When Japan surrendered, there was really no one in control of Vietnam. Ho moved quickly into the gap. With General Vo Nguyen Yap leading his guerrilla forces, they took control of the North. That must have been an electrifying experience for the masses, and they must have felt that this was the moment. On September 2nd, 1945, nearly half a million people attended a huge rally in Hanoi. Ho gave an independence speech that began with the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He quoted directly from Declaration of Independence, and maybe what he was doing was flattering the United States so that they could be on his side. He was disarming his opponents by saying that he was not for going for Marxist revolution, he was only going for plain, simple independence for his country. Uh, he'd admit to being a communist. He said, you know, my purpose is to free up Indochina. I'm not doing anything different than you did in 1776. You managed to deal with it pretty well, and that's all I'm trying to do now. Uh, do you have any problem with that? Ho had no illusions about the tenuous nature of Vietnamese independence. In perfect English, he wrote a letter to his OSS contacts stating, the war is won, but we small and subject countries have no share or very, very small share in the victory of freedom and democracy. Probably, if we want to get a sufficient share, we have still to fight. Ho went to Paris in 1946 in hopes of working out a compromise where Vietnam could become autonomous within the French Commonwealth. I think Ho Chi Minh was trying to postpone uh, the inevitability of armed conflict with France because I think he was under no illusion that the French would give up without a fight. Ho's mission to Paris failed. Back in Vietnam, conditions were even worse than they had been before World War II. The French army returned and brutalized the country. As many as two million Vietnamese starved to death during a famine, while rice was exported to France. Ho appealed to the US for mediation, but never even received a reply. The emerging Cold War between the Soviet Union and America made France's participation in the defense of Western Europe critical to the US. The French agreed to cooperate with the Americans, but the US had to keep out of France's colonial affairs. Ho Chi Minh was meeting with a rather sympathetic French official. He said to him something that is very, very important that the French didn't understand at the time, and which also becomes important later for the United States. He says, if we go to war, we're going to lose 10 men for every one that you lose. But in the end, we'll win and you'll lose. By the end of 1946, Ho, General Diop, and the Viet Minh were back in the jungle fighting a guerrilla war against the French. In 
Initially, it seemed unlikely that the Viet Minh would have any hope in defeating the French. But by 1954, the French were desperate to end the bloody guerrilla war that seemed to have no end in sight. The French decided to spring a trap for the Viet Minh at a place called Dien Bien Phu. They believed that the ensuing battle would end the Indochina War. It did end the war, but in a way they could never have imagined. In March of 1954, the French army believed that they had lured Ho Chi Minh's forces into a trap near a remote outpost called Dien Bien Phu. Unfortunately for the French, they only trapped themselves. The battle cost the French over 15,000 casualties. It also cost them Indochina. The Viet Minh victory over the French marked the first time that a European power had been defeated in battle by its colony since the American Revolution. Ho's leadership and tenacity contributed greatly to the victory, as did the aid of a powerful new ally, the Red Chinese. Ho tried to play down the Chinese communist support. He feared that this alliance would drag Vietnam into the Cold War. And this would mean, therefore, that Vietnamese independence would not be a local question between Viet Minh and the French, but would be now an international question between the two superpowers. Despite the victory at Dien Bien Phu, Vietnam's fate would ultimately be decided at a peace conference in Geneva. Both the Soviet Union and Red China urged Ho to accept the terms of the Geneva Peace Agreement, which divided the country in half at the 17th parallel. It took all of Ho's political skill to get his colleagues to accept the compromise. After 1954, Ho and the communists concentrated on building a socialist state in the north. They implemented a land reform program modeled after the one created by Mao in China. And it was a very brutal program. Lots of landowners were, were executed. Um, it was very corrupt in many cases. The story is that Ho Chi Minh actually realized this thing had gotten out of hand and apologized for it, but of course, it was too late. These people had been killed. The North did not have the only repressive government in Indochina. The U.S. helped install an anti-communist dictator in the South named Ngo Dinh Diem. Diem was not popular with his countrymen. In the Geneva Peace Treaty, Ho had been promised an end to foreign intervention and nationwide elections, which he most certainly would have won. Diem and his U.S. backers did not allow the elections to take place. By 1960, an anti-Diem resistance movement engulfed the South in a guerrilla war. The more the North supported the guerrillas, or Viet Cong, the more the U.S. intervened to counter the spread of communism. Just as Ho had feared, Vietnam had become the key battlefield of the Cold War. We had this idiotic idea that communism was a monolith, that all communists were the same, and Ho was part of that monolith. But there's a lot of evidence that he wasn't. If only we had come to the point where we'd say, okay, he's a communist, but he's our communist, you know? By 1966, the Vietnam War was in full swing. By now, Ho was 76 years old and probably not involved in the day-to-day -day conduct of the war, but he was still the prime source of inspiration to the Vietnamese people to fight on, no matter the cost. Ho Chi Minh died on September 2, 1969, at the age of 79. Though it would be almost six more years before the final Vietnamese victory, most of Ho's countrymen believed that he was the one most responsible for the liberation 
and unification of Vietnam. Today, Ho Chi Minh's legacy is as controversial and complex as the man himself. There is, on the one hand, the image of Ho Chi Minh as the patriot, the leader of his country's struggle for national liberation, the man of simple tastes, a man who is almost more a Confucian than he is a Marxist or a Leninist. The other image of Ho Chi Minh is uh, as an international communist agent, uh, the head of a repressive regime which carried out uh, policies deeply repugnant to many Vietnamese. I think you've got to deal with the dual character of this man. At the same time that you have this image of the kindly, wispy, emaciated, frail Ho Chi Minh, you've got to remember underneath that is a really tough figure, absolutely dedicated, absolutely relentless. The ends were always more important than the means to Ho Chi Minh. But some critics believe that the communist economic and political system that he left behind was too high a price for independence and unification. Ho Chi Minh said in 1945, they would like to have Vietnam independence, freedom, and happiness. And from the three slogans, what is left right now? Independence, yes, but what does it mean without having freedom and happiness? There's no doubt that the communists under Ho often brutally eliminated their political opponents. But Ho's role in this is not clear. Ho was the leader at the time, and errors did take place, so he should take some of the blame. I think he was a, a very driven man, a man driven by the cause that he believed in. As a young man, Ho dreamed of changing the lives of the Vietnamese people, but he probably never dreamed how much he would also change the United States. Ho Chi Minh hands the United States the first defeat in its history, in the longest war of its history. And in that respect, he should teach us a lesson, which is you don't get involved in wars in these places when you're up against enemies that are intensely, passionately nationalistic and are prepared to make these limitless sacrifices to win. Recent estimates of Vietnamese casualties since 1946 are placed at over 3,500,000 dead. This staggering number is a reflection of the steely determination of Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnamese people. Ho Chi Minh's enduring legacy, in terms of his image and the way he is seen around the world, I think uh, probably he's remembered perhaps more than anything else as the leader of probably the most successful movement for national liberation that we've seen in our century. Ho Chi Minh accomplished an incredible feat in helping to free his country and unite it despite the opposition of France and the United States. This achievement required the efforts of a man who was part Lenin, part Gandhi, part Confucius, and all Vietnamese. If you're a fan of Sherman Alexi, and thousands of people are, then you probably know that his latest book is called The Toughest Indian in the World. For those of you who don't know him, Sherman Alexi is a poet, a short story writer, a novelist, and a screenwriter. And he's an Indian. 
an American Indian. Call him a Native American and you're liable to find out just how tough he is. Alexi rejects that term, saying a Native American is anyone born in America. As you will see, Alexi is both very angry and very funny. Ask him why he thinks the Indians lost the war. White people did not defeat Indians in the war because you were better fighters. You were not better fighters. I mean, you beat us because you kept showing up at dawn. <laughs> What is that? It's Custer. Man. He better be bringing lattes. This is Sherman Alexi on tour, hitting bookstore after bookstore, touting his newest collection of short stories, all the while cracking up and provoking his audience. You know, oh, the mascot thing gets me really mad. I'm just thinking about it now. You know, don't think about it in terms of race. Think about it in terms of religion. Those are our religious imagery up there. Feathers, the paint, those songs, that's our religious imagery. You couldn't have a Catholic priest running around the floor of a basketball throwing communion wafers into the crowd. You couldn't have a rabbi running around down there. Hava, hava, kick ass, hava. I mean, you couldn't do it. But yet you do it to us. I mean, I want to start a team of all Indians called the Seattle Saviors, and here's our mascot. <laughs> go, Jesus, go. Fight, Jesus, fight. At home in Seattle, where he lives with his wife and three-year-old son, Alexi is a serious writer, really. He's published two collections of short stories, nine books of poetry, two novels, and one screenplay all by the age of 33. What kind of Indians are you writing about? As opposed to the kind of Indians that everyone else is writing about. Including other Indians. Including so, other Indians. Well, it's that whole corn pollen, four directions, Mother Earth, Father Sky Indian thing where, you know, everybody starts speaking slowly and their vocabulary, you know, shrinks down until they sound like Dick and Jane. And, and it's all about spirituality. It's all about politics. So I just try to write about everyday Indians, uh, the kind of Indian I am, who is just as influenced by the Brady Bunch as I am by my tribal traditions, who spends as much time going to the movies as I do going to ceremonies. Just to let you know, white people, you've brought us some really cool things. <laughs> the internet is, is the cool, I mean, the internet almost makes up for that smallpox thing. <laughs> so there's a lot of humor in your story, but there's also anger. Is there a lot of anger in you? That's a big question. Uh, loaded. Uh, what it reminds me of, in high school I dated a, a white woman and she would come to visit me on the res and her dad, who was very racist, didn't like that at all. And then he told her one time, you shouldn't go on the res if you're white because Indians have a lot of anger in their heart. Certainly I am angry at the situation. I'm angry at the way Indians have been treated and continue to be treated but I don't think it's a helpless emotion. Uh, and I'm also very much a pacifist. Life for Sherman Alexi Jr. began on the Spokane Indian Reservation in Well Pennant, Washington. Sherman's parents and brother still live here. Home? Home, this is where I grew up. Growing up in this government-built house, there wasn't much money and at times not much food, but there were books books donated by Goodwill, and games, the games all kids played. We used to play cowboys and Indians back in those trees. Cowboys and Indians? Yeah, I always had to be a cowboy. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> An Indian kid on the reservation playing cowboys and yeah. Indians? Yeah, yeah. Well, we were American, too. <laughs> so you're watching a John Wayne movie and you're rooting for... For John Wayne. And I distinctly remember doing that. Because I didn't recognize those Indians. I wasn't those Indians. I wasn't running around in a loincloth. I wasn't vicious. I wasn't some sociopath with war paint. You know, I was a bright kid on the res you know, who liked books. And who knew, even at a young age, that he had to leave the reservation to make something of himself. But there's your school right across the street. Well, it was really terrible then. I mean, I remember in sixth grade, I opened my math textbook, and my mom's name was in it. But you knew that right down the road, what, 20-some miles down the road? Was a good school. 
and was a completely different world. Yes. Than there was. Oh, utterly, yeah, it changes dramatically. You go from a very anti-white place into a very anti-Indian place. You know, walking from this township into you know Johannesburg. That's what it felt like. Down the road at the white school, he was surprised to find acceptance. He became captain of the basketball team, the Reardon Indians, prom king, and class president. You're very special to me because I grew up at Well Penitentiary. Oh my God, really? Now, in person, in books, and in screenplays, Alexi is trying to shatter Hollywood stereotypes of Indians as Tonto and the Noble Savage. You get to be so wise in all those movies. But that's so tiring. Who wants to be wise? You know, you get carpal tunnel syndrome from carrying the burden of your race. And uh, uh, I'd like to have villains. I'd like to have goofballs. And, and, and I'd like to have the diversity of Indian personalities represented in films. And that's one of the things I try to do with Smoke Signals, where one of the heroes was this geeky, androgynous, verbose, irritating Indian guy. You know the only thing more pathetic than Indians on TV? Is Indians watching Indians on TV. <laughs> Smoke Signals was the first Indian produced, Indian directed, and Indian written feature film distributed by a major studio. And it stars real Indians. It was Alexi's first foray into movies. He produced the film and wrote the screenplay. It's over! No more drinking! Did you hear me? No more! Let go! There's one unforgettably poignant scene in Smoke Signals when the character based on Sherman Alexie's father gets drunk and leaves the family. I just remember how disappointed I would be when my dad would show up somewhere drunk. You know, I mean, that's just heartbreaking. You leave Dad! Don't you ever come back! you hear me? Don't you ever come back! A lot of what you write is about a son's relationship to his father. Is that based on your relationship with your dad? My father is an amazing man. But what was your relationship with him like? Oh, it, it was good when he wasn't drinking. I mean, he never was a violent drunk, but he would leave. He would leave to drink, and he would leave on binges for days. Oh, you know, in a few instances for weeks. Until I was 12 or 13, I would literally cry myself sick when he was gone. You know, you hear of people dying of broken hearts. And you thought that was possible? And, and I knew it was. You can learn to compensate in all sorts of ways, and I have. In all sorts of amazing ways, I've learned to compensate. But it doesn't change the shape of the scar. One of the ways Alexi compensates for the scars of childhood is to write about them and then to read what he writes out loud to hundreds of people. We knew it was going to happen. We knew it was going to happen one day, and it did happen. Out on Devil's Gap Road, he wrecked all over the highway. He wrecked all over the highway, you know, and he laid out there for five hours before the ambulance. Both his mother, Lillian, and his father, Sherman Sr., with whom he's reconciled, are often in the audience and often the subjects of Alexi's wit. And if he does wake up, he could be somebody completely different. He, he, he might be a vegetable. And my mom and I looked at each other, and my mom says, what kind of vegetable you want your dad to be? 